Hello everyone, I am Guy Valente and this is the Valente Brothers Podcast. I'm here with Pedro Valente. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for joining us. And Joaquim Valente. Hello everyone, happy to be here. Thank you once again for your support. Uh, please remember to like this video, to subscribe to our channel, and to also share it with your friends. It helps us a lot spread the word. Pedro, today we're going to talk um, once again about the purpose of our school and jiu-jitsu in general, a topic that has been now very uh, discussed in the martial arts community, in the submission, I think, wrestling community, um, BJJ grappling, the difference between practicing jiu-jitsu or any of the elements of jiu-jitsu, be it grappling, striking, with the purpose of survival, of self-defense, and the objective of tournaments, sport, competition. So... I think we should start with our trajectory. How did we come to the point we are today and how did we uh, decide to, to focus exclusively on the self-defense element of jiu-jitsu? Yes, we started our jiu-jitsu training with Grandmaster Elio Gris as kids. And the objective of his classes, what we always felt, is that we were being prepared to defend ourselves in a real situation, in a street fight. That's how he conducted his classes. We were always training to defend against punches, to defend against strikes, and he was giving us confidence that we could survive an assault in the street. Obviously, as a child, we're thinking about fighting in the park against bullies, but eliminating any fear that we felt of physical contact or of someone trying to physically hurt us. So that's how we were introduced to jiu-jitsu and that's how we saw jiu-jitsu in the first place. And the scen scenarios were always very realistic. You guys remember how Grandmaster Master Ed would always create real, realistic scenarios. He would get in our face, what's, your, what's up, what's your problem? You have a problem with me? And then he would attack. Simulating how a real fight begins and giving us the elements to deal with those attacks, with those scenarios. Eventually, we started training in group classes. And in the group classes, the focus was more sportive. It was more about grappling. Because... Part of the training that we have here at Valente Brothers is sparring, what the Japanese call rendori, where there's resistance, where there is a chaotic environment, where there's no cooperation. And I felt that the group classes was almost exclusively dedicated to preparing us to be good at sparring. Now, sparring must be limited so that practitioners can engage in it safely and if you only practice to become good at sparring at grappling then you're missing out on some of the most important elements in fighting and that's why we decided at one point of our journey as a school to dedicate ourselves exclusively to self-defense as we felt grandmaster elio grace's classes were. I think as the martial arts through time distanced themselves from the battleground originally, that's how martial arts developed. That was the purpose. And the name, of course, already describes it, martial arts. But as they distanced themselves from the necessities, from the realities of combat, they naturally... Um, moved towards a more sportive environment uh, for many reasons, and we can talk about them later. I would include some as safety, of course, um, commercial reasons as well, an opportunity to, 
to make a profit through competition, through tournaments, through federations. And often, when we talk about self-defense today through the martial arts, we already talk about maybe dual situations, right? One-on-one situations or situations where there are mats, where there might be gloves, where there might be weight divisions. Joaquin, self-defense starts way before the fight, right? We like to talk a lot about risk management, risk assessment. I know that this is very important for you. It is. And uh, I feel that, you know, to use the question that you asked Pedro, something came into my mind that I wanted to share with all of you. And I think Guy and Pedro can also talk about this very well because, you know, we lived with Grimestre at different times of his life. So maybe, you know, we could have a difference of uh, experience with him, even though I think it's very similar. But Grandmaster Elio, I remember in the late 90s, early 2000s, he was really frustrated with the current time that Jiu-Jitsu was living. And the reason was that he believed that the art of self-defense within what Jiu-Jitsu was, was being forgotten. And he believed that it was not possible for you to do both. Like, like some people even talk about today, like as if it was a switch, right? You can do sport and suddenly you can flip the switch and now you're doing self-defense. And this was a frustration of him with, with family members. And, and, and at a time where Grandmaster Elio did not have, I feel, and I say this in a respectful way, but he didn't have the recognition that... Grandmaster Elio has today after he passed away. That he deserved. That he deserved. From others. Yes. But I feel that today there is a much higher regard for who Grandmaster Elio was than when he was alive. And I know it's a hard comment to be made, but I, it's my opinion. I think it's the reality. Well, you were there, and we all had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him, living with exactly. him. Exactly. And you were the last one yeah. uh, in his late 80s, in his early 90s, you were there with him. And, you know, Hoyler was present, um, Hoyce was present, you know, Hoker was there. But, and, and th these conversations were happening with them also about these, you know, issues that Grandmaster Elio saw as a conflict of interest for what he believed jiu-jitsu should be taught for, which was giving people the elements of self-defense yeah and he was very vocal about what he was not happy with exactly so i think that when you talk about doing both i think the problem is that there is a dichotomy sparring versus the practice of techniques in a controlled way techniques that cannot be used in sparring Right, and usually you have two camps. You have certain martial arts that say our style is so deadly that we cannot spar. So all they do is simulation of situations with controlled responses that cannot go to a full training with resistance. Many times choreographed. Many times choreographed. Then on the other side, you have people who say, no, all we do is grappling, is sparring, and that is enough to prepare us for the street fight. And then you have these two camps but arguing with I each other. I would other. add, Pedro, that they do the grappling and the sparring with clear objectives geared for exactly. competitions. Which makes a huge difference. But even if they did it not, if it was only that, in my opinion, that would be insufficient. If you only sparred, even if the... Yeah. You're right, I agree with you. But what I'm trying to say... But I think that's, that's right. But very few... I don't even know of examples like that today. No, there are none that, yeah. I, exactly. know, that I know of. But the reason why it's not enough is because Jiu-Jitsu is composed of four physical parts, which is stand-up self-defense against surprise attacks, throwing techniques, striking techniques, and ground fighting. That's the point I'm trying to make, exactly yes. that. The fact that most people who attack self-defense schools, they talk as if the self-defense schools 
And here I'm going to talk, I don't know exactly what self-defense schools mean because you can do self-defense in different ways. But what we do as Valente Brothers includes sparring. But you said that they're going to say something. What do they usually say? They usually say that they, they treat self-defense schools as schools that only practice techniques without, without resistance. Sparring, without resistance. Yeah. Right? So it's, it, they treat the conversation as a mutually exclusive So that's the as dichotomy. If you could only, yes, as if you could only do one or the other. And the truth is that you can do both. Now, when I say you can do both, I'm not, because we have to talk about two different things. And that brings what you said. How are you, if we're going to talk about the sparring element, which is very important, then we're going to ask the question, how is the sparring done? What is the objective of the sparring? Yeah, and... That's why I asked Joaquin the question about risk management and risk assessment for self-defense. Because I think that even the conversation of sparring, of, of, of already fighting in a dual situation or in multiple opponent situation is already a step way ahead. I think that the training for self-defense starts before the fight happens. What are you doing to avoid the fight? The best self-defense is avoidance. Yes, and what are you doing to... What are your skills to analyze the risks, the possible risks of an environment, of a situation, of an event? Are you being taught these things? Are, are you, you being, being taught these skills? Joaquin, I think a year ago, and, and I know that this is now part of our program, we had, and this was part of your VB tactical program, but... Self-defense includes the ability to know the basics on how to deal with a wound, a cut, a gunshot, different injuries. So if we limit the discussion between, oh, you spar, I don't spar, I can beat you, I cannot beat you, we know very well that many times someone who's a very good fighter, he'll actually put himself in trouble in a fight if he's not trained on all these skills, if he's not mentally trained, if he's not emotionally trained. I agree, but that's why I brought it back. And, and for me, this is so, you know, important, remembering these conversations, Graham Estrella, because he used to talk about purpose. What's the purpose? What are you training for? What's the purpose behind, even if you're doing competition, what's the purpose of you doing that? If, if the purpose is because you want to be a just competitor, great. But if the purpose is to improve your skills to deal with what Guy just spoke about that involves so many different elements in a real-life situation, that involve so many different types of risks, different types of threats, then it's a different purpose. And that's what has to be very clear for each person when they're beginning their journey in a martial arts school or in a jiu-jitsu school or in a sports school, whatever it is. So let me ask Pedro then a very important question because this is, I think, uh, often um, discussed and I know that you have a very strong opinion on this matter. Is it possible to do both? Is it possible, and I'll divide the question into two parts, is it possible to learn both simultaneously as a student And is it even possible to teach both, right, as the instructor in the school, to have both programs? So I'm going to start by citing Isao Okano. He was a, an Olympic um, champion in judo from Japan, one of the greatest names in the history of judo. And he says, furthermore, because they concern themselves more with winning than with true development. So that's the problem with competition. When you go to tournaments often, your objective is to win. And to win at all costs, hopefully within the rules. But you're going to do everything you can to win. And that becomes more important than development. And Okano did that. Okano did that, but then he was looking back and criticizing the development of international judo as a sport and how he was losing the, he actually mentions the word jiu-jitsu in his preface to his book, Vital Judo. He says, when 
he begins, when what is called judo was still known as jiu-jitsu, it included actual combat techniques like kicks, strikes, joint reversals, and so on, in addition to the grappling techniques and throws popular today. But as time passed, the dangerous elements were eliminated, making possible for the development of the sports-oriented judo of modern times. But that's not a problem if the person's interest is not in striking and on self-defense and on on the way and the value and all that. If their purpose is for sport, then I it's not a problem. That. I agree with that. So go back to my question. Is it possible to yeah. simultaneously no. do both? No, it's not possible. Which doesn't mean that an athlete of any kind can do well in a street fight. The fact that you're an athlete gives you an advantage. LeBron James, if he gets into a street fight... He most likely is going to do well. He's yeah. big and strong. So we I'm cannot... I'm not sure, but rugby players, no, for sure. LeBron James, depending on who he fights. Yeah, he's so big and powerful. Correct. And, and I think it should be taken into account that if the fight goes to the ground and the person is a sports or just a practitioner, there is a chance he might sure, do very event. well. The same way that a boxer well, well, standing... There's a chance. You know, there's a chance. There's a chance, yeah. yeah. However, and I think that... Um, we can, again, talk more about that specific point um, later. But I have to say, Joaquin, if you're training, if you're developing reflexes to apply certain techniques that actually oppose elements of surviving a punch, of not allowing somebody to stomp you, of not allowing somebody to knee you in the face even to put the hands on your face, choke you, because those attacks are illegal in sport, actually the reflexes that you develop that neglect these possibilities could hurt you. Could hurt you. And Pedro, you but, just but said, I, and I think the difference here, and we have to make this very clear, this point very clear is this. Yes, if you're talking about a LeBron James type person practicing these techniques, yeah, he's going to overpower most people. But if you have someone weak, someone that does not possess the physical skills... Even LeBron James in a few years when he's older. Correct. So someone who does not possess the physical skills, trying to do a deep, to be very precise, a deep half guard against somebody much bigger and stronger that has good base, the attempt of a deep half guard might actually put you in a worse position. But you're, already, but you're already getting to the deep uh, half guard. I was, I'm going to start with the posture that they use to grapple. Correct. I agree. In but he's just, standing making, up. But but he's just making a point on, on how these moves can work against you because those are reflexes and those reflexes, they only work in a controlled environment, which is what, what a jiu-jitsu sports competition is. There's a controlled environment because you don't have striking. You don't have, you know, the ability for you to fight for unlimited amount of time. You don't have the ability many times, unless you're in open class, to be able to fight against someone who's much bigger and stronger than you. So it is a controlled environment. And once you get out of the controlled environment, a lot of these techniques is something that people are going to have a very hard time in being able to perform them in a realistic scenario. And I agree with Professor Guy. But the reason why I was making this point is that if you analyze the application of jiu-jitsu, as Pedro was reading from the book, on its complete combat version that, as we said, striking, throwing, ground fighting, stand-up self-defense against surprise attacks that includes, includes improvised weapons, includes weapons and all that. There is such a great you know, number of, 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 of possible attacks with multiple opponents dealing scenarios. with only scenarios that you, you need a complete dedication to be able to develop your ability to survive in those kinds of scenarios. So just thinking about a normal person who has a job, who is busy and is coming to train maybe for four or five hours a week, and that's a lot, right? There's not enough time for you to be able to do both. But let me, let me, let me try to organize the conversation because thinking about what people who are, because you have a lot of grapplers right now, BJJ teachers, submission grappler teachers who clearly say, I'm not doing this for self-defense. I'm doing this as a sport. And as you said, there's nothing wrong with that. But you still have a large number of individuals who say, no, BJJ, a BJJ person 
competitor can defend themselves in a street fight because they make the, the, the conversation, the debate personal. So you're trying to say that I'm not able to defend myself in a street fight. And that's a very subjective question. What do you mean, can you... What type of... As you said, there are so many scenarios. For example, a BJJ person. Somebody attacks them, puts a gun to their head and says, I'm going to kill you in three seconds. How is BJJ going to help in that situation? Very little, if not, there's going to be any no help. Not at all. None at all. So it all depends on the type of fight that we're talking about because people immediately think of the duel. They think of a one-on-one -on -one fight. And even in a fight like that, a BJJ person who only trains competition, who only trains sport, how is that person, even if they're high level, imagine if they're fighting, there's some tough guys out there in the streets. And imagine if a BJJ guy is 140 pounds, high level, and they fight a 220 pound tough street guy who's throwing punches. What skills of BJJ are going to help in taking this person to the ground when they're throwing punches. How often do they train these skills? So the point is that we have to, the question needs to be phrased differently. Anyone can win or lose a street fight. Yeah. Anyone can win or lose a street fight. That's not the point. The point is this, is BJJ good for self-defense? Is it enough for self-defense? Is it an art of self-defense? And when I say BJJ, I mean the sport, as it is practiced in most schools today. Pedro, and I, the answer to that question that I would give is no, it's not. No, I, I think that a better question, because as you said, things become personal very quickly. And instead of asking, is BJJ good for self-defense? The question is, is in your BJJ program, Right? Are you teaching in your BJJ program self-defense scenarios? Is Correct. that is that the major objective of your classes? Are you if, regularly teaching? Yeah, and if the answer is no, then you're not teaching self-defense. We're not saying that your students, that yourself, that you're not going to be able to survive a street fight. Depending on the street fight. Depending. You might. Yeah. And there's so many variables. Correct. Someone who practices self-defense daily could also be surprised sure. and could also be in a situation where they will also um, have a problem. So I think that in the end of the day, we just have to be honest. I think there is a there is an element of honesty in this whole debate that we need to understand. And I think that this will allow um, self-defense schools to improve their ability to stay true to their mission and to what they're saying maybe in their marketing um, material. Because again, this conversation and this debate many times hurts both sides. Sports schools that try to somehow stay connected to self-defense underperform compared to the ones that completely um, abandon self-defense and focus exclusively on sport. I think uh, the sports se uh, scene today has proved that point. And at the same time, self-defense schools that are so attached to still trying to you know, compete with the sports schools and they're so concerned about the grappling elements, they're trapped in this world still of sport. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, bringing back the conversation to, are you talking about risk management? Are you talking about the realities okay. of the street? Are you talking about concrete? Me, are you talking because, about, you know, are you talking about what are you uh, even um, looking for in a hotel? If you're going to a hotel, what floor? Uh, where's the exit? Uh, like I said before, uh, preparation for possible injuries, you know, Again, we're in this talk, you know, sparring. You know, I can beat you, I can pass your guard, but, you know, when you're passing the guard, you block your face. That's already so far into the, the because problem. Because in the best case scenario, what is going to be the strategy of a BJJ practitioner for a street fight? E. What, would be, what would be his strategy if a fight breaks out? Try to get a double leg or even, I don't know, pull, exactly. pull, pull, pull guard, try pull to do guard, a, a quick heel Maybe hook. a double leg, maybe a throwing technique. Try to do a take full the fight lock. to the ground. 
a foot lock could work quickly. Maybe. What's the problem with taking the fight to the ground in a street situation, in a uncontrolled environment? Multiple opponents. Multiple opponents, right? What about dealing with weapons? Yeah, and the element also that you're using now, what is the floor? Exactly. What kind of floor are you dealing with? Yeah. And the person who you're fighting with, is he armed? Are you trained once you get to that close proximity fighting to be able to check if the person has a weapon on them or not? Yeah. Yeah, but All those things have to be taken into account. So we are criticizing, we are criticizing, doing only grappling as a sport, as a means for preparing someone to defend the fight. So well, the question I wouldn't phrase it like that, but okay. I would. No, but I wouldn't. Okay. You're not criticizing, you think no, it's good. Because I think it's as Professor Gee said, it's deeper than that. Because you can do grappling for self-defense. But I didn't say that. You said, said do, doing just grappling. Yeah, but I didn't say that doing grappling just for self-defense is good. I yeah. said, we are criticizing. Okay. Because as Guy said, there are not a lot, there's no schools yeah, but that Pedro, are doing. I, I wait, let think, me just, yeah. let me because just, I think I'm you're, trying, you're to trying to separate. The, I'm trying to organize the conversation. I think we're pretty organized. But I think I, I would like to organize it even more. <laughs> because the fact is that there are no schools teaching only grappling for self-defense, as Guy just said before. And yes, I agree with that. Only grappling for self-defense is not good either. So doing only grappling for self-defense or not, if you'd rather that I phrase it that way, we are criticizing doing only grappling or only striking or only sparring. We can keep going. But right now I'm trying to, the, the, the conversation here is what is mainly done in BJJ and submission grappling schools and asking if that is good for self-defense or not. But and I I, and we I, answer that question, correct? Yes, but I want to... Yes, yes. I'm trying to finish my rationale. Go ahead. My, my point here. So, I think we have to divide this conversation in two parts. The first one has to do with sparring versus other elements. And that's the point that Guy has been trying to make here very eloquently. A fight, when you're already fighting, you already made several mistakes in most situations. So in order to have a complete self-defense system, it all begins with giving the students the emotional tools to handle verbal aggression without feeling the necessity to prove a point in fight. Giving the students, as he said, the ability to analyze risk so that you don't put yourself in dangerous situations where sometimes when you have the false sense of security of thinking that you can grapple, you might get yourself in a dangerous situation that with the proper training you would have avoided. Right? So we're talking about emotional tools. We're talking about avoidance, how to avoid fights. We're talking about explaining to the students when it's okay to use the physical skills of fighting and when it's not. These are difficult decisions. Then the four elements that you mentioned, striking, grappling, and how to approach each one of those. The stand-up self-defense against surprise attacks, which is where the fight begins. How to block a sucker punch. How to deal with an attack from behind how to deal with a weapon when you can't escape this. Obviously, for example, a knife. People say, oh, knife defenses don't work. I don't want to be in a situation where somebody's trying to stab me. If I have any way to avoid that, I will. So the knife defenses that we teach are for situations where the knife is already coming in your direction. What are you going to do? What's the most efficient way to deal with that? Do you rather know or not know? It's better to know. Your chances are going to be better. So that's the first thing. The scope of the training. What areas of self-defense are you approaching? Is it okay to only approach one and not the other ones? That's the first one. The second one is sparring versus training techniques that cannot be used in sparring. Do you use only one? Do you use both? Is only grappling enough for self-defense? So I think we have to approach it from those two things and how to train ground fighting for self-defense. What do you mean two things? The two, two elements. One is scope. Right. The other one is how now as instructors who also teach grappling, how to approach grappling. I understand. 
That's another discussion. So we can talk about scope, which is the most important one. And then we can talk about, okay, let's talk specifically about grappling. Is it possible? And then you have to understand how the brain works. Subconscious programming versus conscious thought. Is it possible to practice one way all the time for tournaments and then when you're in a street fight with the stress and the danger of a street fight to change and do something else? No, it's not possible. Correct. So, so th those are the two conversations that we have to have. First is scope. Second, in my opinion. And second is grappling itself. How to practice grappling. Yeah, because that's really the discussion in our community. Correct. Does it ever become the same? Because I've seen people say, and I respect those who think that way, say, well, the only difference in self-defense is that in the beginning you learn self-defense techniques, but then when you're advanced, everybody's grappling, everything is the same. Well, I, I actually, today, I'll say that I don't respect uh, an argument that is very often um, given um, by some jiu-jitsu teachers. You prove your self-defense skills in a jiu-jitsu tournament. Oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. Please, Pedro. That doesn't make any sense. It's like proving that you're good at tennis by going into a volleyball tournament. You know, self-defense is about survival. It's about avoiding fights. And if the fight happens, if you're physically attacked, how to deal with those attacks? A BJJ tournament, you spend most of the time, 95% of the time on the ground grappling, defending sweeps, reversals. So that's my point. The best grappler in the world today, is he the best street fighter? Is he the best combat fighter? Is he the person you would want um, in your elite military um, Absolutely group? not. And also, even the best MMA fighter in the world, and MMA fighters are more complete, even the best MMA fighter, I would not say that that person is the best teacher of self-defense. Because when you say MMA champion, he's right now in his best shape, he's ready, so that's going to give him an advantage in a duel. Not in every self-defense scenario, but in a dual situation. But is he the best person to teach someone self-defense? Is he going to be able to teach avoidance? Is he going to be able to give that person the emotional tools and an analysis of scenarios? Well, does he have the emotional skills? Correct. We don't even know. And when you say dual, again, that's a limited approach to looking at scenarios because you could still be caught in a surprise attack and yes. a headlock yes. and with a big size difference and still be stuck there without knowing a specific way to escape from that you know, attack. So, Pedro, I think we, we, we can go back to, to one of my initial points, which is honesty. And the purpose always of our discussions are positive, right? We're not trying to, to put down anybody's uh, school. We're not trying to put down any system of self-defense, any martial art. I just believe, we believe, I know we share this uh, belief, we need to be honest so that we can strive in whatever it is that we chose to do. So if you're choosing to practice sport, if you're choosing to teach sport, focus on that. The results show that those that have focused on those skills, that preparation, they have excelled. If your objective is to teach self-defense, if that's what you're saying, I'm teaching self-defense, study there's so much material. We're always studying. Actually, right here in front of us, you see some historical, historical books. Um, we have a Taekwondo book. And if I grab this book and I open up the first page, this is, of course, an old Taekwondo book, I think from the 1960s. Um, it says, and I'm using Taekwondo because Taekwondo today is an Olympic sport. And... Today, many people view it more as a sport than a, a, a martial art like for self-defense. But it says here, Taekwondo, the art of self-defense. And the same is happening with Jiu-Jitsu through BJJ. Sure. It happened with Judo as well. And you know, we, we know high-level Judo practitioners, Brazilians, Japanese, Europeans. Judo practitioners today... Don't talk about self-defense. Modern judo practitioners today don't claim to be self-defense experts. 
When someone joins a judo school, they're clearly not joining that judo school for self-defense. I'm talking about adults especially. So we need to have a specific goal. We need to be honest with those that are coming to us, just like we have, Pedro, many times, Joaquin. We have many times students come to us and they say, look, my objective is to become the next world champion in jiu-jitsu. We might talk to them and have a discussion about that. But if that's really their objective, we're honest. It and happened we, to me the other day with a mom. She brought her kid and she said, I want my kid to be a professional you know, jiu-jitsu competitor. And I said, what do you mean by that? She's like, oh, no, I went to a, a tournament with a friend of mine and I want my son to participate. And I said, look, our school's purpose is to prepare your son to be able to defend himself, to give him the values, the philosophy of jiu-jitsu, the 753 code. She's like, no, no, but I want him to compete and to participate in these competitions. And I said, look, I'm going to be honest. We're not the best school for that. Exactly. I want my son to train two but times that's why a day. I think, but that's why I think what you said about the commercial side is something that has to be spoken about. Yeah, because most people look for self-defense. The motivation for the sport jiu-jitsu schools to also advertise and to even have classes for self-defense many times doesn't come from a belief that that's what they enjoy doing, right? I enjoy talking to students and looking at all different possible scenarios that could happen, analyzing videos of street fights, of, uh, you know, assault battery and uh, robberies and trying to understand what would be the best way for you to survive, for your family to well, be able you, to survive. You, you have a degree in criminology. Exactly. So, but... I don't have, you know, if you tell me tomorrow, look, there's huge potential of money to be made if we open a competition class so that some students can start going to competition. I don't have an interest in doing that. Yeah. We, we, we have, we've... I don't follow, we've you know... We've had that opportunity and we chose not to do it. I don't follow, you know, BJJ competitions. You oh, know, yeah. I know I, you I don't. I don't follow any of that. I know, you, and I know you love grappling and you grapple a lot, yeah. but I know you don't follow any... And, and that's where, you know, I wanted to, to debate... Pedro and this. Let's do it. On the on the grappling side, because when you say the, the you know that some people claim that once you get better at grappling, it becomes very similar. I understand what they mean by that. What do you mean very similar? In the sense that a sport jiu-jitsu practitioner, as he improves, yeah, because it's gonna become very similar yeah, to a to a, 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 a combat practitioner of the art of jiu-jitsu as he improves and he continues to practice grappling if you see them just practicing grappling it's going to look very similar the way they train yeah said that's that? i no i didn't no, he say said that, that people I, say that i said ah. that i respect people who say that because people even friends of ours have been saying that saying what saying the only difference between self-defense and bjj is that in the self-defense schools we teach the elements of self-defense in the beginning. But then yeah. everything else is the same. That I completely disagree. I completely disagree. Yeah, I completely Me disagree too. with that. Me but too. but that if you take just yeah. a sample... That what happens after is the same. And when, I, and, and when I say a sample, is a sample of just a limited time frame. And you see uh, a, one of our sparring classes, just one day in which we're not doing striking, we're not allowing people to hit each other that day, and you look at that, and you look at a sparring class somewhere else, it could appear to be similar. Sure. Y you know what? But, but, but hold on. Mm -hmm. But what they don't know is that yesterday I was training with a student with slapping aloud. And it's interesting because the student likes to do some specific techniques from the guard, and as soon as we started hitting each other with slaps, his game changed completely. Yeah, and you see that in the difference between grappling in MMA and grappling in sport jiu-jitsu, you see that there's a clear difference exactly. already. Because but the, but the question here becomes things. this. But hold on, I was going to say something based on what you were saying, and I think I forgot. You were going to say something based on the fact that I, about being similar. Yes. So, I believe, Pedro, that the instructors, the, the teachers that, that say that, my guess is that they're probably part of what is known as old school. Uh -huh. I think old school teachers are those that learned jiu-jitsu in the 70s or 80s, which is kind of when we started also learning jiu-jitsu, right? You, 
in the late 70s. I started in the 80s, Joaquin in the late 80s, early 90s. But we don't consider ourselves ourselves to be part of that old school movement, right? And I thought, I think that a lot of these instructors, they come from a time where sport jiu-jitsu was still beginning. It was still in its early days, in its almost inception. Mm -hmm. Could we say that? And at that time, sport jiu-jitsu was not the focus. And the techniques that they practiced... I think even in the old days in the Federation, for you to score a point off a sweep, you could only do a, 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 a few, specific yes. sweep, right? And these sweeps are sweeps that we still use today because these sweeps are connected to sweeps that you can use in and are fight. safe to use in a fight. So maybe they're, they're with all due respect, uh, I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but they're a bit stuck in time and they don't see the evolution of sport grappling, which has been great for sport grappling without the pot like i said before without taking into consideration the punch the kick the elbow all the possibilities in a fight in a real street fight so and i thought of this joaquin because oftentimes when uh, modern sport jujitsu bjj practitioners either if they come to our school to practice but if they see a video of advanced students of ours grappling Oftentimes, they'll say, wow, this looks like um, jiu-jitsu in the 1970s. This looks like jiu-jitsu in the early 80s. The moves that they go for, they only go for specific moves. The guard is very limited, right? There's so much more to it. Maybe we don't think that all of those other techniques are good for fighting, just like in MMA, which is still controlled where... There are many rules. You can't stomp. You can't knee. You can't hit a, a, a back of the head. Yeah, the back of the head. And even then, you see that there are many techniques that are used in sport jujitsu that are not used in MMA. Weight divisions. That's and you see many difference. times, you know, in in recent times, great uh, a great display of jujitsu and grappling in MMA from people who never were very successful. In sports competition. So it's interesting to be able to analyze that. That's very interesting. That changed completely. Because, you know, the use of jiu-jitsu in uh, a fight with punches is not the same as the jiu-jitsu used in sports competition. Yeah, I think that and now that's, is so clear. No? And, and that adaptation is, is, is where we believe cannot be done with a flip of a switch. So how, you know, because I'm trying to bring up things that I see online, people saying, so that we can give our opinion. So, for example, I see a lot of people who come from that old school mentality saying, I go to the sport competitions because I think it's great, because I, I, the adrenaline and I like to work on my emotional state during a moment of pressure like competition, but I, I don't care about the points. I do it old school for self-defense. I only go for the submission. That's my only objective is to go for the submission. Is that self-defense? No. And oftentimes, some of them criticize stalling. I think stalling is more important in self-defense than going for the submission. Going for the submission is good for entertainment many times. Of course, if there's an opportunity, you take it. But this mentality of, they compare it almost to, to soccer, right? Which is clearly a sport. And they say, we play forward. Yeah. It's a, a Portuguese expression. We play forward. We attack. We attack. We don't hold back. Even in soccer, many times the team that wins is the one that waits, waits, waits and counterattacks. But anyways, uh, there are different strategies in sport. But for self-defense, you cannot afford to just go for submissions and put yourself in a position where now you could get killed or you could get knocked out, Right? And we always say this in class, position before submission. I think many jiu-jitsu teachers have heard this before, but it's not enough to just say that. It has to be part of what you do and, and I, what you teach. And I think we can even go back to, if we study history, we can see even the Gracie brothers, right? You had... You're talking about Carlos and Elio. Yes, the five brothers. But I was going to talk specifically about three. You have... 
different objectives and different styles. You have George, George Grace. George Grace. He was a competitor at heart. He loved to compete. He went to wrestling tournaments. He, went to, he, he would do matches with wrestling rules, with limited rules, with striking, without striking. And he just wanted to win as many matches as he could. He fought a lot. And he was more of an athlete, and he treated jiu-jitsu more as a sport. Then you had Grandmasters Carlos and Elio, who treated jiu-jitsu as an art of self-defense. So every match, they would try to bring it as close as possible to a situation where there were limited rules. They never accepted points. And Elio Gracie said, my objective in these fights is not to win, is to not lose, just to prove survivability, my ability to survive. That's it. To show that that person cannot beat me under those conditions. And Pedro, again, and I know exactly the what point, you're the talking point that I'm about. Making, just make the point. The point that I'm making is only that a self-defense strategy is more defensive. Correct. And you're talking about the application of that strategy and philosophy still in a in controlled environment. Sport sure. controlled environment. And as I say many times in my classes, I believe that sparring. This is interesting. I would like to know if both of you agree with my um, idea. Sparring is more about emotional development than physical self-defense development. I agree, but I also think that it's important that you learn how to deal with chaos. Of course, but hold on. I'm not saying it's not important. No, I understand. Yeah. I'm saying... It's sure. almost more important. Sure. When, I, when I say sparring, let me um, rephrase that. The grappling, mm -hmm. that long round, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes, sparring where you're on the bottom, somebody is on top of you. What are the chances that for someone normal, right, especially considering what we teach as far as risk management, risk assessment, that you're going to be in a dual situation, one-on-one, -on -one, and you're going to be sparring maybe in a grass field for so long with someone who's attacking you. Is it possible? Yes, you're attacked at home. No one is there to break it up. Uh, maybe you're traveling from Miami to Orlando and you're caught in the turnpike at night and nobody's going to break it up and you have a fight and it keeps going for, for five, ten minutes. The point is that most, and Joaquin said we study that, Right? Not only through our law enforcement um, resources, but Joaquin studied four years of criminology. And I know you did many uh, studies on this matter. A fight, statistically, is quick. 30 seconds is, an, is, is long a fight. long fight. So many times, a quick um, solution, right? Practiced enough, having the ability to apply a good throw, having ability to understand what to do very quickly on the floor, striking techniques, oh, and being and aware and about weapons, like you said, is so much more important. Again, I'm not saying that grappling and resistance training is not important. It is integral. With that, without that, you're not complete as far as self-defense. Yeah, it's important to say that. Yes, very 100%. Clearly. Because then we go towards the direction the of dichotomy. the dichotomy. Yeah, I'll kill you with the yeah. eye gouge mm -hmm. or I'll grab your throat and you don't have to spar, for sure. But you understand my point Absolutely. and what I'm trying to say. I understand. And, and my reflex when you ask the question about, you know, saying that it's more emotional and, and the lessons have to do more with the emotional side than the physical side, my tendency was to disagree. But then if you think about it, the solutions to most of the problems that comes out when a student begins to spar is connected with the emotional side. Yeah. And for you to be able to have him do the correct physical application of sparring, the way we see that sparring should be for combat, you have to help him be able to overcome the obstacles that are connected with his emotional control. Yeah. With being able to deal with the discomfort of being at the bottom with someone much heavier and bigger on top of you. So that's the point. So you, so you have sparring and you have non-sparring training. Let's divide it into two types. What's non-sparring training? You use kata. Yeah, but let's say non-sparring versus sparring. What's non-sparring training? For example, when you drill a punch defense, 
That's non-sparring training. Any drilling of drilling throws. Drilling. So anything that doesn't have resistance. Yeah. Well, even even I would say that something like fight simulation yeah. is not sparring. non-sparring. And even if it has controlled resistance, like if I'm with a knife, I'm trying to attack you, and I pull a little bit. I'm I'm giving. We're not sparring. We're, we're resisting, yeah. but controlled resistance. So if we divide it into to, those two elements, sparring right? is no cooperation between. Yes. The toddy. The toddy and the wookie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, in the sparring, they're both toddies. They're both toddies. Correct. So the question is this. We agree that both are important. You need to have non-sparring training and you have to have sparring training. Correct? So BJJ is mostly sparring training and or tra non-sparring training specifically directed for sparring and nothing else. Correct? Most BJJ schools are that. So what if somebody says, okay, so what I'll do is this. I'll do the non-sparring training that you guys teach at Valente Brothers. I'll practice the stand-up self-defense. I'll be very good in that. I'll practice the throws. But at the same time, I'll enjoy the, the, the fun of competing in BJJ tournaments and, and, and going to tournaments. And Why can't I do both? Well, you should be able to do whatever you want first. Mm -hmm. right? But why is that not the best way? So if you ask my opinion... Mm -hmm. If you would like to know my opinion. For the purpose of development of self-defense skills. Because in first place, it's people's freedoms. Correct. And the ability for them to do whatever they, they want. But in our opinion, at least in my opinion, um, Joaquin talked about time management. Exactly. I, I think that's very important. Time management. What's realistic as far as your ability to dedicate enough time. And again, that's why the... If you have a professional life yeah. and you have a job to attend and you have a family to attend... If you have time to dedicate yourself to be able to go to a sport competition, I guarantee to you, most likely, you're not doing other things like so many others that you're already not going to be doing anyways yeah. because it's hard. It's already hard. But what about stop the bleed? What about weapons training, right? What about understanding how to deal with chaos? Yeah, yeah. And we so, do this kind of training here. So let, let's go back to it. And, and then, Pedro, so that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is that if you're participating in a competition where there is a winner and the so-called loser, you're not going to want to be the loser. Exactly. You shouldn't be willing to be the loser just for the sake of competing, right? We have friends that are coaches in, in, in sport and they talk about that. You know, in Brazil, which that's very debatable, but in Brazil, we grew up with the notion that coming in second is being the first place of the losers. That's, I think, Vince Lombardi. Correct, <laughs> right? So in Brazil, nobody, oh, you came in second in the South American championship, you know, nobody cares, you know, you lost. So, um, so yeah, if you're doing that, you should want to win. You should want to win the prize. Um, and, and if and you want to win, you're going to have to adapt exactly. to the rules. And, and you're going to start more and more practicing for that. And you're going to start, again, going back to time management, saying, you know, let me... And that's what we saw with Grandmaster Elio. I think even Grandmaster Elio realized that eventually. Realized that eventually. At first, maybe he thought both could be done. And that's how the whole creation of the Federation and, and using judo as an example to be able to, you know, create the rules and all that. But then he started to realize that and he was very honest. That's something Grandmaster Elio had. He was very honest and he didn't care how far he traveled in the wrong road. Once he saw it was wrong, he would do a U-turn, come back and tell everyone, hey, it's the wrong road. Correct. Because of what he wanted. Exactly. He, still, he never abandoned the mission, but he realized that the, the, the path he was taking was leading him towards the wrong direction based on his, on his purpose. final destination. Yeah. Right? So the question that I have is this. What exactly... Are you willing to sacrifice, not you, what are competitors willing to sacrifice in order to win a tournament that they're not willing to sacrifice in order to win a match in the sparring class here? Did you understand the question? Not really. So <laughs> what are... I was trying to process. What, <laughs> what are competitors willing to sacrifice? Uh-huh in a tournament, okay. that they're not willing to sacrifice. I think that's the key question here. 
Because if not, if it's hold the on, sa- complete the question. What are they willing to? I'm repeating. Yeah. What are they willing to sacrifice in a tournament? In a tournament, they're, that not, they're willing? not willing to sacrifice in a sparring class. Our sparring class? Yeah, because when you're sparring, you start standing up, you keep going on the ground, just like in a tournament, in a BJJ tournament. That's not true. It is no because How does, we do uh, no, no, drills. No, no, no. But I'm forget that. Sometimes we do sparring without striking, right? Sometimes, sometimes, but but I think no, all of our more, students, if you look at their arm positioning, no, hold on. So if, are you are you against sparring without strikes? No, but but you got that. That's what I'm saying. So if you take a sample, then it creates a misconception. So I think you're not understanding the question because the, the question is exactly for you I'm to be able to. Still trying to understand your to question. Able to say that. So because more and more, Peter, we're trying to have students practice with striking more yeah, and more we're trying we to don't, right? it's just that it's unsafe correct to do it often correct right but we try to have but a striking class but we still agree we used to do it even more okay so you have non-sparring training and sparring training mm-hmm. one thing that Jigoro Kan realized is that you cannot have full sparring with no rules because people are going to get hurt so in order to protect the safety of the student one thing that we do here often at Valente Brothers we do a lot of things yeah but we also do sparring without strikes. Okay. And that resembles a tournament. Sorry, I don't think it does because if you look at the way the students here that's at the school, the, question, but that's the, the, the way people train here at the school, they train in a way like like Guy said, so let me, that, that it resembles more a, an old way in which people don't do certain positions, their arm positioning. They don't expose their back. They don't expose their back. The arm positioning is different. They don't and, allow and, and if the question is what creates that, I think is the way in which jiu-jitsu is taught, okay. the way grappling is taught. Let me ask the question in a different way. Maybe I don't know the answer. Maybe yeah. answer the yeah. question. Clear. No, I want to. I want you guys to answer. Okay. <laughs> the point is this: when you, the audience, please comment if you already figured it out when you watch this video. Yes. <laughs> answer yes. it for us. I think I'm asking in a complicated way. Okay. It's my fault. So let me try to rephrase it in a simpler way. Um, let's say you start. Your objective is self-defense. Yeah. Okay. And then you come to the sparring class. Obviously, in sparring, you want to win. But you're not willing to sacrifice turning your back, for example. So, Peter, I think I understand now exactly uh, what you're trying to ask us and the point you're trying to make, right, through your question. Um, I believe that the comparison you're making has a central problem. Because... In sparring, we're not fighting in the street. And in sparring, that's why I I said that I believe it's more emotional than physical, the benefits of sparring. Because in sparring, you should be taking some risks. Of course, you're not using, for example, the loopholes of the rules of tournaments, which, by the way, most of our students, I think 99% of them don't even know the rules of sport grappling, um, as an advantage to then create techniques based on the loopholes, right? For example, as I said many times already, no strikes, uh, even hanging on to the guard and allowing somebody to pick you up. Think point. about that. That's my point. Right? So yes, we don't do that in sparring. Our students don't do that in sparring because they understand, of course, uh, through our teachings, that if you do these techniques... If you repeat these techniques, you develop reflex. I interrupt you because that's the point that I'm saying. In the sparring class, it's possible to make that decision because you're not fighting for a medal or in a professional case, you're not fighting for money. In a tournament, you're hanging on to the guard and you think that by keeping your legs crossed, there's 30 seconds left on the match and and by the guy picking you up, you're going to hold on, you're going to let the guy pick you up because you want to win. If the guy is almost passing your guard and you can turn your back to avoid the points, you're going to do that. That doesn't happen here in the sparring class. So that's no, it's why... It's a conscious effort that yeah. you make initially. Of course, through learning technique, we start talking about that in our Fighting Foundations curriculum, the principles of jiu-jitsu. And that's why I think the, 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 the essence is the way in which we teach jiu-jitsu. Because if you allow just the students to continue to train on their own without our guidance... We see those things happening sometimes. Correct. And, and, and what do we do? On the end of the sparring class, we're like, remember, everyone here is training with the purpose of self-defense. 
There's no medals given. We're not marking tallies of whoever can tap who more times. When you walk out of here, you 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 have to be able to be ready to defend yourself. And if you're hanging from the guard, you will get slammed uh -huh. and the fight could be over. If you're turning your back, someone could hit you with an elbow to the back of the head and the fight could be over. So in the end of the day, it's the culture and the guidance that you create inside of your school that's going to create the ability for the students for the students to be able to practice jiu-jitsu in the way that they wish based on their purpose if they're in the right place. But the point that I was making with my question about sacrificing is that I agree with you, it's the culture, but even with that culture, if the students who are learning that culture, they can spar in the sparring class and they'll follow those rules and those techniques and those teachings. But if they start going to tournaments, they won't do it. They will start in the sports tournaments, yes. That's what I'm saying. But if we create the same kind of energy that oh, sure. he said that many people go to tournaments because you're looking to be able to test themselves and to feel the butterflies on, on the stomach. Same, be careful with that. No, I think that many that, people have tried to yeah, create these energies in tournaments. To tournaments. No, 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 no. There's no. What I'm saying is you can create that kind of feeling in the training. Because sparring class. Simunition does this. Well, not only sparring class. When you when you put someone in the middle of the circle and they're being attacked in the end of the fighting mastery class. My point. In so many different instances that we have in the school where you create that kind of yeah, feeling because pressure, that feeling is important of pressure. I agree. So as we approach the, the point, end of the this episode... I, let me just make my point. Of course. To finish. Wrap it up. My point <laughs> is that it is impossible when someone... I don't care what kind of culture you have, what kind of teachings you have. Once the objective becomes to compete in tournaments... They're going to ignore because they want to win. Yeah. In the sparring class, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm in favor of sparring, but I'm not in favor of going to tournaments. Obviously, here at Valente Brothers, we have the Fudoshin Challenge. We have things that we do once a year, twice a year, a team context to be able for, for people to feel the pressure and the adrenaline. But it's still very different, Pedro. Very I different that, than fighting yeah. for a medal. No, but it's not just the medal, right? I think that... Um We really have to wrap it up because we like to keep these talks <laughs> not too long. But I, 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 I kind of disagree with the point. You know, the the we agree, but it's not just the metal. It's you know the foundations, the the fundamentals, right? I never said it's just the metal, but I think there's a difference between sparring in a sparring class and what you're willing to sacrifice, and in the tournament and what you you're willing still, to sacrifice. You can still. Be in a very competitive environment. That's why. That's why we say that we do competitions because every time you spar, you're competing. Every time you're training, you know you're competing in your in, in your life. When you wake up, you're competing. Uh, but what do you you compete? But you compete within yeah, exactly. certain so, rules. So, so I and what are the rules that you're competing under? So in the, the sparring rule. class, yeah. you're competing under. It's not about the rules. There's something bigger than the rules. The problem are the rules in a tournament. Yeah, but we have rules in the sparring class too. Yeah, correct. But for the under our culture, under our yeah. uh, guidance, and with our purpose of yeah. self-defense, that's what changes. Joaquin, when I said the problem are the rules, I'm not talking about the rules. I'm talking about the specific grappling rules. So is it possible to take students to a tournament and they put them in the tournament but still keep that... No, we, we, we have, answered. So we, we have answered that question already multiple Any times, but I, I think it's good that you're really uh, that's hammering it. I think we, we have made that clear. I think that you want to win. Everyone wants to win. Sure. It's if okay there is to a prize, win. yes. And if there are rules, you're going to find the loopholes, you're going to neglect whatever is not part of that competition, and you're going to fight. To in the sparring class, you, you still have those rules and you're not going to try to find the ways. In the tournament, I think you will. That's the difference. And we might dis agree to disagree on I, that. I, don't, I, I lost track with what I'm trying to, to agree and what I'm trying to <laughs> disagree. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. no, you're the one that said you disagreed. I said, okay. Got it. No, It's a good discussion. Students usually like whenever we, we have these more heated discussions. I have so. to actually watch it again. I have to watch this episode again to understand what was the point <laughs> you try to make towards the end of the episode so that I realize a good one. and learn from it. But um, no, thank you. It's a very important topic and we're always trying to, to learn from it as we are students of the 
art of self-defense. And there is no better way for us to learn than through, of course, studying and discussing this with so many of our friends who we know are also uh, or share the same mission. So any final comments? No, I think just um, to wrap it up, as you said, the fact that we respect people who like to go to tournaments. We think that there's nothing wrong if that's your objective. We believe that everything we're saying is for the purpose of learning self-defense, what's the best path? Yeah, I think that's very clear, of course. Thank you so much, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.